participants, the aspects that, um, and just if you're coming in, I'm just recapping a little last week to give everyone an opportunity to come on in and get their donuts and take their place and pass along their kids if they want to. Yes, uh, yes sir. So the question uh, that Serena has is, what's the best way to encourage vocations? Well, first and foremost, uh, all vocations at their very core are about loving God and loving others, right? I mean, so basically when you get right down to it, whether it's a, 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 a vocation to married life, to religious life, to priestly life, a vocation is about spending yourself in love of God and of neighbor, the church. So the more and more you cultivate a context in which they realize that life is ultimately about love, the more and more their, their soil, so to speak, of the soul would be able to receive a seed of a vocation and have it cultivate. So what can happen is through the, the tender years is if a child grows up in a context where all the things that are exciting, all the things that are the most captivating in life are the things that harden the heart, when a seed of a vocation that comes from God falls upon a hard ground, we hear in scripture that it bounces off. It can't take root. Or if a seed falls upon ground that is rocky, it can only take a shallow root and won't survive. Or if there are briars and bristles, the things that, that shouldn't be there that are, it can choke it once it takes life. So using that analogy, using that understanding, that metaphor, when we talk about young people in cultivating a disposition where they could have a vocation in life, the first thing you need to do is just make sure that the soil is fertile. And the way you make sure the soil is fertile is cultivating habits of prayer, cultivating a, a habit in the home uh, that sees as the most important thing in life as what is the greatest commandment, loving God and loving neighbor. And that does more than any explicit conversation. Because the truth is, when it comes to vocations, God has a way of weighing in, and weighing in strong to the hearts of young men and women. But the thing is, that weighing in, that grace that comes from God, if it bounces off a hardened heart, it has no access. It can't take root. So you can then, when you work on the sort of soul of the, the rather the, the ground of the, the soul, that is the disposition of the soul, making sure that you have fertile ground for seeds to fall, you can then also talk about how it is that every path in life is oriented to heaven, uh, should be oriented to heaven, to, to where we go after here, and talk about those different paths. Talk about marriage, talk about priestly life, talk about this. But talk about, in terms of vocations to the priest or the religious life, that those are a way of entering into marriage in a very different way. That the vocation of marriage is one that points to the true marriage between Christ the Bridegroom and God and, and the Church. So the true marriage in heaven is one. It's Jesus and the Church. The Bride of the Church and the Bridegroom of Christ. And so priests and religious participate in that eternal marriage here and now. So we don't escape nuptial love. We enter into the end of nuptial love. That toward which all nuptial love is oriented. And so uh, we, we can see in our own vocations something about nuptial love. So hopefully that answers a little bit as to how you can cultivate vocations in the home. Now I'm going to jump in because we have enough of a crowd. I was just recapping a little bit of last week how it is that we spoke about the, the um, sanctifying function of a pastor. A pastor is one who is a priest, prophet, and king. Those are the three categories of the Old Testament that together make up a definition of a pastor. And the priestly function is a sanctifying one. And we spoke about how parents can sanctify in the home. 
Now today I want to talk about the teaching or prophetic function, the way in which parents teach in the home. Now the first thing to understand and to really uh, grasp is that the parents are the primary teachers of their children. That is incredibly important to understand. God has given you, in all respects, the moral responsibility of educating children. In fact, so, so clear is this in the mind and in the teaching, so clear is this in the mind and in the teaching of the church, that when we talk about the ends of marriage, like the, one of the purposes of marriage, we say for the procreation and education of children. So we say that marriage is oriented not only for having children, but to have them and educate them. We never say just have them. Because as you know, just having a child is the easy part, even for moms who go through labor and nine months. The hardest part is everything that happens after that. So it's procreation and education, which is to say, not just having children, but then attending to them through their formative years. So you will always hear the language of the church talk about the ends of marriage, the one of the purposes of marriage is procreation and education. And it's not just talking about education as in giving information. I'll get into that in just a second. But when I say in all respects, you know, not only are you responsible for doing what you can to teach them in the ways of sciences and the humanities and all of the access of, and help them access all of the education that is available in our society and culture. And as a society and culture, we do certain things like put together public schools, the church puts together Catholic schools, and there are other private schools. So as a society, we kind of all come together and we do what we can in the best way that we can, especially in a pluralistic society, to pull together systems of education so that parents can do their best to educate. Some parents are in the position and make the sacrifice as well to homeschool. And so they will take that role on directly. But whether you homeschool or whether you go to a private school, a Catholic school, or a public school, or your children go to these different schools, you still are the primary educators. We don't outsource the education of our children to anyone. Nobody has been given the role by God to educate your children except you. And that is what I mean when I say that parents need to understand that they are the primary educators of the children. No one, ideally speaking, should care more about your children than you. No one. I, would, I was recently having a conversation with uh, a young person, and I said, look, your parents are going through this with you. He's in his 20s, and he's going through some certain things. And he's talking about how his parents are having a hard time. And I said, I know it's hard to understand, because as a young person, you're standing on your own two feet and you're walking autonomously. And it's your life and you're working it out. And you have this kind of habit of getting out of the nest and telling your parents, leave me alone, I'm gonna make these decisions. But the fact of the matter is, you are a part of them. And everything that happens to you will happen to them. And there's no other way around it. And you will eventually understand that when you have your own family You'll eventually understand that as you grow to understand families and mature. So I just said, you know, be, be patient and understanding with that. Because it's important to understand that yes, it is also about that because it happens to them because it's happening to you. So I think that when we understand that role between parent and child, we can understand why it is that nobody really ought to have the type of investment in the education and the formation of your children than you. 
Nobody has that level of interest. Nobody has that much on the line, which is to say your very hearts. So I've just really hopefully highlighted with very strong language the primary role of parents in educating their children. The type of assistance that society offers, including the church, is by default secondary. So let me put it in terms of religious education here in a parish. We do not educate your children in religion. That happens at home. We play a supportive role. Now ask anybody who's tried to function as a catechist, and they will tell you the children that get it at home, they respond well, and it works. And the children who don't get it at home, they are very frustrated, the catechist, because nothing ever sticks. And my response always to the catechist is, well, what would you, would you expect anything else? How could, during an academic year, that is, a fall and a spring semester, have, generally speaking, one hour a week with a catechist be enough for religious education? It simply is not. But what we do is offer a resource. What we do is we offer religious education to be a supportive and secondary role. And people, good people here in the parish, many of you who assist in this function, are trying to help. And so I'm constantly reminding catechists that they are not the primary teachers of the faith of the children. And I tell them, neither am I. <clears throat> All we can do is play that supportive role. My role as a pastor, which happens primarily here at Mass, primarily here in the parish, is to reach out and to help that ongoing conversion of parents. And the more and more there's an ongoing conversion with the parents, the more and more the children will start to be trained and educated in the faith. And when that happens, then the kids over there who come for a secondary type of religious education through our catechetical programs, they get supported. But there is simply no way children will learn what they need to learn about their faith in one hour a week from first grade to ninth grade during an academic year. That's not possible. We don't even expect children to take on any other topic, math, the social science, with that limited amount of time. No, that's the most important topic which addresses the very meaning of life. So, now I've kind of highlighted to you not only that you are the primary educators of the faith, and that we all, including public and, and parochial and private schools and religious education programs, that we here play a secondary function. I'd like to also speak about the areas of education. So if you are the educators, the primary educators of your children, then what are the topics that you are going to take on in teaching your children? Well, all topics can be divided into one of two categories. Educating their minds, we call that the intellect, or ed educating their will. Now it's this second part, which sounds kind of a bit of a paradox, but I'll explain that in a second. It's really more properly said by forming the will. But it's all part of education. You see, on the first part, information is critically important. Getting information in order for us to know what's going on is, the first, is really the first step. The church talks about one of the, the primary roles of the church and her pastors. Do you know what it is? the proclamation of the Word of God. Because if no one knows the Word of God, then how can anyone possibly be evangelized? 
How could anyone know what happens in the sacraments? How could anyone know how it is that God takes residence in our own hearts and in our own lives? How could anyone know anything? So the proclamation of the Word of God is absolutely critically important. Information has to be passed along. Without the information, then how is it that we can process anything? So it has to be given. And good information needs to be given. One of my pet peeves with religious education materials that have come out over the past 40 years is that they obscure things. A lot of the materials obscure. They don't speak clearly. And I think sometimes it's because the people behind them putting the material out, do this specifically because they want to avoid contentious moral topics or contentious religious topics and want to be palatable. But that doesn't help anybody. I remember when I went to religious education, I can't tell you anything other than one important fact, that God loved me. That was important. And that stuck. But beyond that, nothing. Now, I'm sure that some people tried. But I'm also fairly certain that the materials were incredibly weak and obfuscated. They just were opaque. They weren't clear. Such that I didn't learn about the Most Holy Eucharist until I was in college. After having received Holy Communion, you know, for, you know, since I was seven years old, until I was about 20, 21 years old when I first kind of discovered what it was. And I'm sure people tried to tell me about it. It just didn't register. It was probably seed hitting hard ground. And it didn't take root. But uh, I have to say, if this information had been presented to me or in some sort of consistent way, I would have remembered it. And I didn't. And so there's a lot of information that needs to be passed. So information is incredibly important. Clear information is incredibly important. The the program that we use here is called Faith and and Life, and it's put out by the Ignatius Press series. One other, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit of trivia. These religious education programs, they present themselves to be approved to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Of all of the religious education programs ever to be submitted to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops that was approved without being sent back for emendation, editing, clarification, content. Only one was passed, and it was the Faith of Life series. And in part, because it was just clear. Now, that doesn't mean that it has the best and the most pedagogical approaches. You know, they may not have, like, the you know, best class plans or whatever. But you know what my philosophy is for catechists? And it's my philosophy for you as taking on the primary teaching function of your children, especially in the area of religious education. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't even have to be a trained catechist. You just have to be the best third grader or fourth grader, or fifth grader. Whatever your kid is in, look at the material. If you gave it a fair shake, especially something with like the, the Faith and Life the Faith and Life series, if you just look over the chapter, I promise you, your adult mind will comprehend it such that you can be the best fifth grader. And you could then answer questions for your children. And I know deep down in the heart of every parent, they want to answer these questions. And it is so satisfying what parents do. And so all you gotta do is basically take this little religion class with them. And the materials are bite-sized. I mean, these programs are designed for once a week. So they're not massive. It's not even even like going through their regular coursework at school, where the materials are, you know, they're meeting multiple times a week. We're just talking once a week kind of material. And the content, of course, is going to be interesting because the reality is you want to know. It's not like you're going to have to help your kid with algebra where you really don't care what, you know, 2x plus 5 equals 9, what is that? You just don't care. Presumably you care a lot about the topic of 
your, your faith. And so, even if the material itself is a breeze for you, great. But if it's not, hey, listen, fill, fill in the blanks. You know, fill in the potholes of your own education formation. And when that happens, I think it's fantastic. I know some parents might say, I'm kind of embarrassed if I learned something looking over my you know, third grader's text. Don't, don't be embarrassed. I think it's fantastic. I mean, God uses children to bring the parents you know, to, into greater understanding of their faith as well. It's a beautiful thing to parents to be evangelized by their children in this respect. Accept it. Don't be humiliated. It's a gift. So, not only is there the issue of uh, receiving information, but we also have to teach our children how to think. Now, this is incredibly important. And I don't know that I ever really thought about it uh, in, 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 until I was uh, older. And I don't know that my parents ever really thought about it, but they certainly did model it. How to think, how to examine, and above all, intellectual honesty. These things have to be modeled at home. Intellectual honesty basically means, and one of the ways in which you can teach your children, is that when you discover you're wrong, admit it. There's no greater way to teach your child about intellectual honesty than that. And be grateful for those occasions where it happens and nobody ever wants to be wrong, but be grateful when it does. Because what you're teaching to that child is incomparable. Incomparable. Intellectual honesty, I have to say, was a key in my pursuit of the faith and the key in my being able to receive the faith and ultimately a vocation. I always want to know what was true, even at any expense of cost. I didn't regard the cost. I just wanted to know what was true. Because if it's not true, then what's the point? But that type of intellectual honesty, I realize, comes a lot from what was modeled by my parents. Truth mattered. Honesty mattered. Admitting when one was wrong mattered. All of that is modeled and taught in the home. How to examine. Having conversations with your children about even the stupidest of things. I mean... Hey, Mom, Dad, you know, how does concrete set? Why do they have to put water on it? You know, I don't know. Let's look it up. And then, well, why would they? And then taking it farther. And having a conversation, going further with it. But what you're doing there in those opportunities is you're, you're teaching them how to be analytical and how, how, how to look at things from different sides at different angles. And those things are incredibly important. And those are skills that they're, that they're learning. Now, this is just the one hemisphere of educating your children. You're talking about inf- dealing with information and thinking. But the other hemisphere has to do with the will. What we choose to do. Now, we don't really think about this in terms of education, per se, which is one of the reasons why oftentimes programs use the word formation because it's a broader term. Because formation implies a cultivating of the will toward the good, shaping one to choose the good. So you can have really smart people that do really evil things. That's not who you want your children to be. So we also have to take the opportunity to teach our children, you know, what we call the, the, I'm not going to get into the virtues, but the cardinal virtues, you know, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, but I'm not going to get into that because it just sounds boring. If you want to be bored to death, go to Father Christian's class on RCIA. (laughs) He'll teach you all about it. But I'll give you sort of the bottom line. I joke, I joke. He has a good crowd. He has a really good crowd. They're gluttons, I think. But they're obviously getting something, so people keep coming back. It's a good thing. But uh, we have to have certain dispositions, attitudes. We have to cultivate certain dispositions and attitudes with our children so they choose what is good. 
you, you want your kid to be the one that helps the kid who's you know on the floor crying and everyone else is walking by. You know, you want your kid to uh, you know go over and uh, you know reach out and help another. You want your child to come and say to you, "Hey, mom and dad, can I give this away to so and so because they don't have it?" That's what you want, and you can educate in the sense of form these virtues, these dispositions, these habits in the soul so that they experience that good. So they experience what it's like to be charitable. They experience what it's like to live a faith in God. They experience, when they start experiencing all these goods because you're kind of forcing them a little bit to experience them, when they taste them, you're educating in a broad sense. You're forming them to choose the good. You know, not every kid is going to want to give away a present of theirs. But if you walk them through the process and you give them that experience and they actually eventually do, I guarantee you, when they get done, they're going to feel good. Because they've done something good. And they wouldn't have if you didn't show them the way. Work them through the impulses to keep for oneself and then to ultimately be generous and sacrificial. So the point is, formation of the will is incredibly important in cultivating the dispositions of the person, the character, the soul, so that we desire the good, they desire the good. Walk them through, let them taste it. Look for opportunities to educate your children in this way. I'll give you just a couple lessons that I've learned as a pastor in the parish in educating uh, parishioners that I think cross over fairly well for parents as those pastors of the domestic church, pastors of your home, in this role of educating. The flock, whether it's the flock of the home or the flock of a parish or the flock of the church universal, the flock is constantly tempted to alter clear thinking in order to accommodate oneself. This is a temptation. What does that mean? What does it look like? It looks like denial. I don't want this to be true. So therefore, I'm going to come up with all sorts of rationales. And then one of your friends stands back and says, um, I think you're in denial. <laughs> Everyone else can see it first. Why? Because we're caught up in our own thinking. What are we doing? We're justifying. And that's where having good friends helps. Because they'll tell us, uh, yeah, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. I get why it is you want that to be the way it is. I get that, but yeah, you're not thinking straight. It can look like denial. It can look like justifying bad behavior. It can look like avo avoiding accountability and blaming others. We're constantly tempted to accommodate ourselves and sully our thinking in order to do that. But this is where it goes back to that point of intellectual honesty. We have to be truthful with ourselves. And if we're not truthful with ourselves, then we can go down these paths of denial, of blaming others, of not having any sort of accountability. And this is where the, the sacrament of the confessional can become your best friend. You want to help your children to face the truth, even when it says some ugly things about oneself? Teach them how to examine their conscience. Tell them to go to confession. Walk them there. And if you haven't been yourself in a while, it's a great thing to do. Model it for your children. Do it for yourself. You'll be happy you did. The point being is that this sacrament is an incomparable asset and tool to every parent who wants to teach their children about this type of intellectual honesty, this type of accountability, this type of uh, being able to think clearly even when it's at expense of ourselves. So I encourage you 
to understand that a parent's best friend in this point can be the confessional. So this, uh, this, this issue about sullying our thinking and, and allowing ourselves to be misinformed and finding people with letters after their name online who just bolster what we want to be true uh, is incredibly important to comprehend, not only in the raising of our children, but also in our own, our own pursuits. The bottom line is intellectual honesty, clarity of thinking, how to examine, not, uh, not sullying the way we think because of our own personal goals or ends, and also then cultivating the attitudes of our soul so that we choose the good in raising our children to taste the good so that they want it more and more. All of these things are ways in which we form the intellect and the wills of our children. And so we do it here as a parish. You can see we try to take a certain role. We have education programs, this being one. Uh, we have other, other programs, Bible studies and things like that that happen to provide that information. We try to model in our homilies clear thinking, honest thinking, clear information. We try to pass it along to show you that we're supposed to look at the truth even when it says ugly things about us. We're so, in, the, in the confessional, we here do everything we can to, uh, to be accountable, to show how to be accountable, how to reckon with what is true. All of these things. And you can do this at home as the primary educators of your children. You can do all of those things and passing on the information, giving them all the tools that they need, clear thinking, not allowing them to sully their thinking because they want a certain outcome. Although it is a lot of fun to watch children justify why it is that they should get their brothers or sisters presents on their birthday. I mean, that's just a lot of fun to hear them go through these intellectual gymnastics on why it is they should get gifts too, you know, or you name it, it's just a lot of fun. But what you're watching there is precisely the thing we're talking about that every adult does too, is justifying, right? So you got to walk them through all of that. Um, and the other is, as I said, here in the parish, we do, we all, there are all sorts of apostles, ministries, and programs where people are encouraged to do the good. And hopefully we're forming people so that they can desire the good ever more. And you too, by guiding and providing opportunities in the home, can shape the will, can shape uh, the souls of your children so that in their wills are more disposed towards doing the good. So that's it. Next week we're going to take on the topic of your kingly function. So bring your crowns. And uh, I'm going to tell you all the ways in which you're meant to be kings of your own, kings and queens, but kings in the broadest sense of your own home. So we'll take it from there. I gotta get over. We got mass in five minutes. For those who are coming at eleven thirty, I will see you over there. Bye, Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen. You're welcome. <laughs>